Hear now a reading from 2 Chronicles 20, verses 13 through 21. All men of Judea, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He, stu- he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Jer- Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by, by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kahothites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in the prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him in splendor for this holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, your word is alive, sharper, and a two-edged sword, active, able to discern what is true and false, good and bad in our hearts. So we ask you now, Lord, to come and guide us through this piece of Scripture that we may not only understand, but having understood that we might obey. In Jesus' name, amen. We are talking uh, in this series about replenish, about restoration, and I want to talk today about the single most important thing, I think, to charge your soul. Let me say it again. This is the most important thing I know of. It's not the only thing, but it's the most important thing to charge up your soul. This is as important as that white cord that lays on the counter or by your bed that you plug your phone into. This is as important as the outlet on the wall that you plug your coffee maker or your alarm clock into. This is as important as the pump at the service station that you pull up to to fill up your car. This is where God's people need to come to recharge, to refresh, to refill. We've talked about all sorts of different ways that God has given us to refresh. I just listed a bunch. Uh, not all of these apply to all people, but uh, we, we talked about stop to stop keeping score, just to trust the Lord is, is the one who's in charge, to practice Sabbath, to have an endless summer kind of attitude where there's always a goodness and a warmth from the Lord, to forgive yourself and to forgive others, to reconcile relationships, that, that recharges us to redefine yourself as God does, to bear one another's burden, to share with one another. We've talked about to be the non-anxious presence and to relinquish control and to learn to be still and to remember hope. All of these are a part of replenishing our lives, of getting back to a place where we have strength to listen and serve the Lord. Um, But the most important one is what I wanna talk about today. That's to be a complete worshiper. Not to worship, but to be a complete worshiper. William Templeton was a worship leader and pastor in the early 1900s, and he wrote this definition of worship. 
Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of our conscience by His holiness. It is the nourishment of our mind with His truth. It is the purifying of our imagination with His beauty. It is the opening of our hearts to His love. It is the surrender of our wills to His purpose. And all of this is gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable of. And therefore, the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. To be complete worshipers. Uh, we are amazingly blessed here at Cherry Creek. Uh, we do something very different. We have three services and all of them have their own style. They're, they're not similar, they're not repeated. Uh, if you start on Saturday afternoon, how many of you have been to a Saturday night service? Uh, it is small, it is candlelit, it is dark, it is quiet, it is re reflective. Evan leads a group of amazing musicians, stand-up bass, maybe a cello and a percussionist, and it has this sense of rest and focus, and we take communion every week. It's, it's kind of a rhythmic sense of, of uh, being worshipful with God, and I love it. It, it. it touches me someplace really, really deep. Um, first service is the traditional service here, where we put on our robes and uh, it's the largest service that we have. We bring the choir in, and there's a glory and an excitement and an energy that happens in that service just because of the, the choir leading us that is really, really special. And they do a great, great job. They are excellent, and, and Evan does a wonderful job uh, leading them. And I love that service. I love that service. Um, and, and then there's this. We don't call it the contemporary service anymore because we don't have enough laser lights and fog machines <laughs> to really meet contemporary worship anymore. Contemporary worship has moved on uh, to a place where maybe you have to have little bins of earplugs on the way in. Um, I'm not critiquing that. I want you to hear. I'm, I'm doing exactly the opposite. What I'm saying is that different people need different things. And our convergent service is a chance for us to still have liturgical elements and to have band-led praise music, but not overwhelm you. In fact, our band isn't up here. Sometimes people ask, that messes me up. Why doesn't your band up in the middle? Well, it's because the band and, and the choir aren't the center of what we're doing. We have intentionally put them off to the side because it's not a concert. It's a place to be complete worshipers. And I, I, love, I love this service, guys. This is our fastest growing service. Uh, all of our services are actually growing. That's a blessing from God, who know? But, um, but the reality is that there is, there's something awesome in each of them. And I, I feel like they're my children and I, I wanna secretly tell them each, I love you best. I love you best. I love you best, because I love them all, and they all reflect something. So, so here's the interesting piece of this, to be complete worshipers. What happens is, because we are by nature selfish, we pick the service we like the best, that has my style, my way, at least as close as I can get in this church, this is what I want. Uh, some of you, if we had a country service, you'd go to that. If we had a classical service, you'd go to that. Maybe if we had a rap service, you know, you'd go to that. I don't know, but we pick what we want. And I think in doing that, sometimes we lose what worship is really about. It's a place of emptying. It's a place of <sighs> exhaling and not being able to choose just what you want. It's not a cafeteria where you pick what you want. It's a place to come and take your attention off of yourself off of what you like and focus on the Lord. But that doesn't mean you can't like something. In fact, my premise is that because we're all different, that's why we all 
worship a little differently, and that's really okay, so long as you don't say that your favorite worship service is God's favorite worship service. Because God shows up in all sorts of different places. And I wanna talk about that, about being a complete worshiper out of um, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Great, great passage. As I've been uh, reading this passage in 2 Chronicles, um, the Lord has brought an image to my mind. It's, it's not a very holy image. It's not a very theological image, but it keeps coming back to my brain, and so I'm gonna share it with you. And hopefully it will help you remember what it means to be a complete worshiper. This is the, this is the God-ordained image that he has brought to my mind. Maybe it's not the Lord, but, but it's interesting to me how m I think sometimes the wars arise in worship styles because we choose one over another, and in so doing, we leave vital parts out. We, we skip them. Uh, for example, um, some churches are based on emotionality. People are dancing and singing and raising their hands and moving around. And, there's lots of energy, and again, I'm not critiquing, I'm just observing, but, but sometimes it's all driven by how feelings are. And, and I almost want to sing quietly in the back, if we only had a brain, because it skips all the ties to the theology and the scriptures and the things that I really want. It's not just an experience, it's supposed to be something more than that, and so I feel like we're the scarecrow sometimes, not complete and missing something. Um, that's not true of worship when God's people are supposedly doing it effectively. So let's look at chapter 20 of Second Chronicles. Um, Jehoshaphat and the southern kingdom of Judah has just defeated some of their enemies. It's cost them a lot though. It's been a very, very difficult battle and now they limp back into their villages and back into Jerusalem. And it's at this moment when they have victory but exhaustion that this happens. Chapter 20, verse two. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom and from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already at Hazon Tamar, that is in Engedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So, as Jehoshaphat's army goes back, some of the tribes that have been on the other side, the Jordanian side today of, of the Jordan River, they decide, look how weak they are. Look how beat up they are. And so they decide now is the perfect time. And they all unify and they come in to attack God's people at their weakest moment. I think that happens almost all the time. Satan waits till we are weakest, till we've expended our energy, and then he comes and, and attacks us. And that's what happens. And so the king, Jehoshaphat, calls everybody to Jerusalem, says, come, come here and we're gonna worship. And he actually proclaims a worship service. They come to seek the Lord. Verse five, then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and built a sanctuary for your name saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before the temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Um, 
I love this section because what Jehoshaphat does is he begins to remember all that God has done. He engages his mind and he starts listening. Aren't you the God that's done this and this and this? It's almost a recitation. It's a very left-brained experience. Let me go through all the things that you have, you have done for us, God. Remember our ancestors. You did this for them. Remember that. You did, remember this. He, he uses his mind and he is just thankful recalling all the things that God has done. He, he almost ties it all back to here's what God has done for all our ancestors. I love it because it takes thought to remember what God has done. It takes a mind to say, thank you, Lord, for this. Uh, this week, we're all gonna gather and have Thanksgiving. And at, at my house, we, we take a piece of candy corn and everybody at the table has to take it out of the jar and before they can eat it, they have to say, I'm thankful for this. From the youngest to the oldest, we praise God. It's, it's a, a ceremony of remembering. I, I like that. I like that it's not just an emotional cry, but it's a very, very somber remembering of what God has done. And I hope you do that. I hope you take time this year. And I know it's, it's a hard time for family sometimes. You're together with people you'd just soon not be together with. You know, you, you've put the children's table, you know, in the neighbor's house, you know, hoping that they'll all be over there. Or maybe that's where you put the, the grandparents, is next door out of the patio. Um, it's hard to be together and it brings up all those family issues, but it's good to remember. My brothers and sisters, it's good to remember what God has done for us. Um, and, and true, complete worship isn't afraid to think about what has happened or to analyze how God has worked. But that's not enough. In fact, uh, there's a lot of churches where I think they have the brain part, the remembering part, the analytical part down really well. And if I'm honest, uh, our remnant of life from the Scottish Presbyterians makes us more apt to connect at a brain level. Give us theology, give us logic, give us, give us solid stuff, and to sometimes leave our hearts in the car. All that dancing and swooping and flags and shouting and singing, not us. I mean, many of you, let's be honest, are, might as well just be paralyzed from the neck down when you walk into this building. You, you have a hard time not engaging beyond your brain. And, and, and complete worship requires something more than that. It requires the, the tin man to say, if I only had a heart, I need a heart too. I need a heart for the Lord. I, I love what happens then as, as Jehoshaphat continues to pray at verse 12. He said, just listen to the passion in these words. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He's moved beyond you're the God of all these things that you did in the past to right now, right here, Lord, help. We need you. You are our God. You're a personal God. And a big army is coming, and, and Lord, we do not have the strength. We do know, not know what to do. And, and if you don't get the personal connection, the heart connection, uh, then let's read verse 13. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. That may seem just like a data point to you, but I'm telling you it's not. What he's really saying is we're crying out, we need you, Lord, and look. The fathers are here. The mothers are here. The teenagers are here. Even the vulnerable ones, the babies, they're here. We're all here. We've all come out. Lord, if you don't protect us, we all die. 
You are our God. This is our family. You are the head of our family. It's a very personal call out to God. This intergenerational piece is, is really right from the heart. Lord, look at our families. Look at how we love them. We do not know what to do, Lord. But our eyes, the eyes of all these people, are on you. Complete worshiping requires not just brain, but also a sense of, of heart. There has to be a connection that goes beyond knowing about God to a place of knowing God, to a place where he actually ripples into who you are. Um, I know for some of you that's really hard. This service is much better. If we went to the first service, holy moly. I try to get them, you know, okay, everyone, let's see if we can raise our hands to our earlobes, Simon says. And, and that's just not their way, and that's okay. God makes us all differently. But in some level, I'm trying to figure out how do I get their hearts to engage with God? And you know what I found out? I sing songs that touch them at the heart, songs that they've known for a long time, hymns that they've been singing and take them back. Christ the Lord is risen today. Whoa, you listen to them sing that. Amazing grace. Wow. So, so we have to almost intentionally find ways beyond just body action, but to, to song and, and melody that calls them to a place of heart connection. That's why I love having different services. You see, the truth is we're just trying to get you guys to connect at a heart level in some way. And for, for some of us, it's easier in one style or another. We get a brain. We get a heart. That's what complete worship is about. Um, but there's, there's another piece in here. Jump ahead, if you would, to verse 20. What happens is a prophet shows up and says, uh, God will be with you, don't be afraid, just go out and fight them. And so they all go out. And at verse 20, early in the morning they left the desert of Tekoa and they set out, as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem, have faith in your Lord, your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. I just love that. So the, the people are marching out and, and the message is God's gonna be with you. He's gonna take care of it. He's, he's prophesied over you. He's got this, don't worry. I know you're at your weakest and the enemy is at its strongest, but it's all gonna be okay, trust him. And so Jehoshaphat, the king, consults with the people, and you know what they say? We need a praise band. We need a choir. We need some people to sing. Look at that. After consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness. It's almost like the need of the people is, okay, we're marching out. We trust the Lord. We know it, but can we sing? Can we sing? And so they start to praise, praise him. They sing praise songs. They do amazing things. They sing, give, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Now the whole story turns at verse 22. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy them and annihilate them. And after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped destroy one another. What happened? As they began to sing, the Lord creates confusion in the darkness and he destroys their enemies. Back to my little picture. I think sometimes what we really need is courage. We need to realize that worship is just not to make me feel good or to get a chance to sing or to pull out the old song. It's not to give the band a job or Susie a chance to show off her amazing vocal talents or the choir to 
show how good they are. It's not about that at all. It's a place of warfare. When we sing as complete worshipers, my brothers and sisters, we declare God's glory. And when people are declaring God's glory, the enemy is in confusion. They begin to kill each other. They run off. When people come with complete worshiping and they just sing and they just praise the Lord, that is warfare. That is a sword and a shield and a buckler and a war horse just by singing, by engaging, not only up here but in here. All of a sudden what God says is, I will use this. Scripture says that the Lord himself inhabits the praises of his people. He lives inside our praises. So when you come to church and you begin to sing, somehow the enemy hates it. I, I was in Thailand a few years ago and we went to a lot of places where we prayed and you know, a lot of pagan sites and a lot of temples and Nobody really cared if we prayed around the temple, but the second we started to sing, even quietly, all of a sudden they'd come over and they'd start mumbling around us to try to distract us, or they'd, they'd start chanting their own things. They did not want us to worship anywhere around their gods. Why? Because I think their gods were gonna leave. And they knew it. They knew that worship was our powerful tool. We don't come to church just so we get fed, just to hear somebody talk, just to even learn the scriptures. We come to do battle. We come to sing. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moite and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. It's why worship is such a big deal. It's why one whole book of the Bible, the Psalms, is a song book. It's a hymn book. It's because when we sing, we do battle. Now, I, I love this. If we only had a brain, oh, we do. If we only had a heart, oh, we do. If we only had courage, oh, we do. So I'm looking for the place in here, honestly, where Jehoshaphat clicks his heels and says, there's no place like home. There's no place. Then it would have been a really perfect Sermon, wouldn't have? I can't find it. I think that sometimes we, we'd rather just have something homey. Rather have something that feels good to us than we would come and say, with my praise, Lord, I will do battle. I will declare your goodness. This last uh, year, I had a chance to visit Tallinn, Estonia. Spectacularly little, beautiful country. We rode bikes through here, and, and this is the amphitheater. In the name of Jesus, be gone. <laughs> this is the amphitheater where in 1988, you see, they gathered to sing. The, the Russians who had been char in charge of them for almost 40 years, since the end of World War II, had outlawed religious singing. They had outlawed singing their national songs. They had said, you can't get together and sing. They allowed them to meet in small churches for small services, but never sing. And by 1988, the people of Estonia had had enough, and they decided they were gonna go to revolution. They were gonna revolt against the, against the Russian uh, Soviet Union. And so they decided they didn't have any tanks, almost no guns, no airplanes, no army. What could they do to defeat the Soviet Union, the most powerful army in that part of the world? And they decided there was only one thing they could do, they could sing. So they started gathering, and first in small groups, in small churches, and began to sing. And eventually, they met for a five-day music festival in this amphitheater. They gathered at dusk after work every night, 100,000 people, and they sang all night long. 
They sang all their Christian songs. Any song they could remember, they sang. They sang all their Catholic songs. Any song they remembered, they could sing. And they sang all their national songs, songs that they had learned from their grandparents and their great-grandparents. They just sang them, and the Russians said, you can't. And they smiled and kept on singing. And the Russians said, we will arrest you and kill you. And they smiled and kept on singing. And pretty soon it wasn't 100,000 across the country in all sorts of little places, little street corners and little churches and little schools. People gathered and they sang songs until a million people in Estonia were singing songs. I want you to get a little taste of what that might have been like in 1988. They sang for five nights, never stopping. A month later, they sang for another five nights. And a month later, they sang for another five nights. And by 1990, the Russians had had enough. They did not beat the smiling, singing revolution. So they withdrew their troops and they went home. And in 1991, Estonia became one of the first of the Soviet bloc countries to become free. Not a shot fired, not a person killed, but just a song. Um, I looked up the words of that song because it moves me even though I don't know what they're singing. What they're really saying is, this is your nation, Lord. This is your place. Do not forget us. Come. Give us your strength. Give us your blessing. My brothers and sisters, when we worship with our minds and our hearts completely, or as Jesus said, when we worship in spirit and in truth, it doesn't matter where you worship. Still the forces of darkness flee. They are crippled. They destroy each other. You, you wonder why we have so much junk in our homes, in our families, in our lives, in our country. I think it's because we don't really worship. We come so that somehow we get. I'm done with that. Pick your favorite worship service. Praise the Lord for it. But strap on your sword and get ready to come do battle. For when we worship the Lord, the Lord destroys his enemies. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord destroyed their enemies. That's why we come to church. It fills us up, and we're not even sure why, but somehow we know we're about God's business. And that's what we're supposed to be about. Let's pray. 
I know some of us feel like we don't have good voices, Lord, so how can we sing? We can barely carry, carry a tune. But Lord, you don't care about the tone, you care about the heart. You just want us to think about the words and then bring forth the best we can offer. May our praises be offerings to you. May they rise to heaven like incense. And Lord, may they push the forces of evil far away. We thank you for the many ways that you bless us. Lord, now may we, this Thanksgiving season, really, really, really bless you with our worship. In Jesus' name.